Danny Stackers. One, one story. Uh, someone... Sorry, sorry, Danny. I tried. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> some, you want to come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, someone was telling me the other day uh, that it's, uh, and he's quite a historian. He said that they engineered planes by looking at the planes returning from a flight mm -hmm. and uh, knowing fully well if there, if the wings were riddled with bullets, knowing that a wing could survive. So if a ca plane came back, instead of putting the other additional armament on the wings, they'd put it on certain parts of the fuselage, just w looking where the uh, the planes had survived, how they survived. I give you courage points for trying to save fuselage. No, I didn't do it very well, good. but I tried. <laughs> it was very well. Actually, you know you pulled it off. Every once in a while, you hit one out of the park, Billy. Hey, were those B-17s or B-24s in Master of the Air? Both. Oh, uh, B-17s in Master of the Air. Master of the Air, yeah. And then they had P-51s in the last couple of uh, right. episodes. So, uh, in studio, Danny Staggers, elder care attorney extraordinaire. In oh, downtown. one more <laughs> thing. <laughs> and, and then after John finishes, I have one more. I know you do. <laughs> Danny, good morning to you. Pull your mic a little closer to the edge of the table there. All right, morning, sir. we got it. Good we morning, sir. How are you doing? Today? Excellent, thank you. If you have elder care questions, you can reach Danny Staggers in Martinsburg. Danny, tell them how. Yes, I'm at 133 East John Street, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, telephone number is 304-267-3915. Very nice. What are we talking about today, Daniel? <laughs> I'm, Besides I, whatever Bill wants to talk yeah, about. Yeah, and, and I'm looking at Bill because I'm thinking, you know, he always says, well, you ought to talk about something new. If I don't talk about something new, you're not bringing me back here. So, That's true. And maybe this is new. Maybe this isn't. Bill, has, it, Bill has veto power on yeah. the show. <laughs> and, and I also have a very short memory. <laughs> All right. Anyway, what I want to talk about is so many people come to me and they'll say, well, my parent or a loved one's in a nursing home and, you know, we can't do anything now. And, and it's not true. You know, even if a person is in a nursing home, we, we can protect the assets. For example, let's take the home place. And, and that's probably your most valuable asset is, is real estate. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the land sitting there, if you don't do anything, estate recovery will come back and file a claim against the estate. To protect it from what? Well, and that's a good question because um, in today's world is, is if you're getting Medicaid, uh, when you pass, and it's not until you and, and a spouse pass, then the estate recovery from the state of West Virginia is going to come back and file a claim against the estate. And so that means that real estate will not be able to be sold because that claim is sitting out there. And, and so you've paid your taxes all, all your life. You've you know, maintained a, to be a good citizen. Uh, and then next thing you know is you've lost that real estate you've worked hard for, and want to pass it on to your loved one. And, and so one of the things we can do is what is called a transfer on death deed. And the transfer on death deed is this, is um, mom and dad would do a deed to children, a loved one, uh, but it's revocable. Therefore, there's no five-year look back because you haven't transferred anything. But when you pass, it goes outside your estate directly to your loved one and creditors in West Virginia cannot go after anything that goes outside your estate. So by you know doing that transfer on death deed, and we should do it now. We don't want to wait till somebody's in a nursing home, but we should try to do that now as a preventative measure just to protect that asset. Uh, we had a case one time in Hampshire County, and the lady just happened to see I was doing a seminar at the hotel there in, in, in Romney. And she came in and she said, I've already spent over $200,000 of money for my mom to stay, be at a nursing home. She didn't have to spend that money to keep mom in a nursing home. We could have done, uh, we could have done a, uh, an annuity to protect that at that point in time. We could have taken the real estate and put it into this transfer on death deed. And um, when, when I want to do that transfer on death deed early, because I've had a circuit judge tell me, don't do a transfer on death deed uh, by power of attorney. You should have your loved one do that ahead of time. Just so there's not a question of you using a power of attorney to get it into your name. Are you, so how is the, in, in, the, in that circumstance, how is the nursing home actually getting paid? Is it getting paid on the equity in, in the home? No. What happens is once we get a person Medicaid qualified, you know, then what happens is Medicaid kicks in and then the income of the person goes to the nursing home. But, so, are there, but aren't there a limited number of Medicaid beds? 
there is. And that's why, you, you know, we, and when I say, I don't want to say I do it all, I have to work with the family closely to get that done. It's just not, you know, a lot of times you take your, your case into an attorney and he, he or she does that work. But this is working together with mom or dad or a daughter. What happens is you look around and you try to find a nursing home bed. For example, uh, you may live in, in Berkeley County and there's no beds. So now you start looking maybe Jefferson, Morgan. Morgan has two really good nursing homes over there. You might go to Tucker County. There's a good one in um, um, Thomas, West Virginia. But once you get in and then a Medicaid bed opens up here in Berkeley, then we can move them, you know, here to Berkeley County. You know, and preferably you <laughs> hate, well, I like saying it, and, but West Virginia is so much better in a Medicaid application than Maryland. West Virginia wants three months of bank statements. Maryland wants five years of bank statements. Now, West Virginia in those three months, if they see suspicious activity, they're going to say, we want to see the five, you know, the five years. So it's so much easier in, in your application, you know, to get all the information to, you know, the Department of Health and Human Resources than the other states around us. What constitutes suspicion? Well, Bill, let, just when in those three months, if if you see, like, for example, I had a case one time where mom every month was giving away maybe $200 or $300, and it was going to a grandkid. What do you think happened over those five years? And that's exactly what happened. Mom was given to the grandkids every month, you know, for the past five years. That would constitute a penalty because you made a gift. So what, what DHHR says is because you were gifting, then we're not going to pay for Medicaid at the nursing home for, you know, three, four, five months, six months. Because of those gifts. Bill, does this mean I have to give you back the money you've been sending me monthly? <laughs> I don't know if he's kept an account of it, Ron. It's already, it's already spent. <laughs> so but, but in that circuit, Mom didn't know she was going to have a stroke. She was just gifting she didn't. stuff. She did, but that doesn't matter because, John, here's the point, is what happened prior to 2006 was wealthy people take all their money, give it away, and qualify for Medicaid. And Congress said, no, you're not going to do that. You know, they're going to take that five years and look back to see there's not been a methodical, you know, transferring of assets. Danny, if you have long-term care insurance, is any of this affected by that? Long-term care insurance is, is a good program. Really, the, the Medicaid process was made for, for long-term care insurance. But the problem with it is, as you get older, it gets more expensive per month. And, and so it becomes cost prohibitive for so many people, if you can have it and can afford it. I had a case one time where a mom went to J.C. Penney in 1940s, in the 1940s, bought long-term care insurance, 50 bucks per month, never could increase the premium, but the benefits always were there, would always increase with the cost. And it was probably 15 years ago, she got into an excellent nursing home, could pay for her and her husband. But that was foresight to be able to do that. But again, you know, with the long-term care insurance, is it going to cover the whole cost at a nursing home? So still, we've got to, you know, we've got to do some planning to make sure that we get that covered. Um, you know, as is the other thing I want to cover, and I'll come back to what I was just getting ready to say, is um, a lot of times um, people in the nursing home, and I know they mean well, is don't go to an attorney, he's going to charge you. But you spend all your money down to $2,000, and then we'll have you qualified. And you don't have to do that. And, you know, the other thing that I always encourage, and every time I'm on the show, Bill, <laughs> this is a repeat, <laughs> is, is have a power of attorney. Get it done early, you know, because you just don't know. And that power of attorney can be there to be able to move money, to protect assets, to, um, you know, to buy things for the person. If you don't have that power of attorney, now you're going into court. Now you're going to spend fifteen to $20,000 to go through a court hearing you know, to, to get a guardian conservatorship. Why do that? Why not get that power yeah. of attorney? It's a lot less expensive than spending fifteen to $20,000. It's 000. a lot less expensive. Yeah. And, and not just any power of attorney, you know, and I don't want to, but you want to make sure you have a gifting paragraph in there. What I mean by gifting paragraph is if I give Bill my power of attorney, I want to say that Bill can take my assets out of my name, put it into his or, you know, his name or another loved one's name. you got to have that in there because... I go down, let's just say, John, I have your power of attorney, and I go to Edward Jones, and I say, I want to transfer the money out of his name to protect his assets. If I don't have that 
paragraph in there, they're going to look at me and say, it looks like you're stealing. <laughs> you know, and they're mm -hmm. not going to give the money. We had a case like that where an attorney did not put that gifting paragraph in. Mom had about $100,000, couldn't take the money out to protect the assets. Mm -hmm. so, so it's so important to have that gifting paragraph in there. You want to have a paragraph in there about creating, you know, like a, an insurance policy because with a single person, I can do an insurance policy and protect the assets. For a married couple, what we have to do is we have to do an, an annuity, you know, and it has not just any annuity. It has to be what is called a Medicaid qualified annuity, meaning it has to be irrevocable, non-assignable, and actuarially sound. And, you know, you learn as you go along. I guess that's why they call it the practice of law. But a guy came to me and he said, oh, I've got this bank that we can do this, you know, Medicaid qualified annuity. DHHR will look at the assets as of the first moment of the first day of the month. So if you said to me, I want to get mom qualified for March, I'd say, uh-uh, March 1 is already going by. But if I come to the end of the month, I want to make sure I can buy that annuity to protect mom or dad's asset. You mentioned the insurance policy, Danny. If I remember from my first job out of college was at Northwestern Mutual Life. Mm -hmm. Life insurance proceeds and policies pass through the estate without being claimed by any creditors or debtors or the it government, goes, correct? It goes outside the estate. Out, what, yeah. yeah, outside the estate. Direct. But the problem with that is is during your lifetime, if you can cash it in mm -hmm. or borrow against it, it's a resource. So i got to cash it in to get somebody Medicaid qualified, unless it's a term policy. And that's what we can do for a single individual is I can buy a term policy mm -hmm. And then that means it's going to uh, be there while the person's in the nursing home. But when they pass, it rolls outside the estate directly to, you know, to the loved ones, which we've saved all of our life, paid all of our bills and, you know, done everything according to the rules. Is there any Medicaid provision for in-home care? <clears throat> well, and that's a frustrating topic for me because there is. It's called in-home uh, in uh, support maintenance. But it's really, really hard to get. It's uh, one of the things I've been told and I've never experienced. Uh, I've gotten a couple of people qualified for it. They call you. A person from Charleston calls you and says, how you doing? What is the most uh, oh, common God. accent? Yeah. You know, well, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Like, yeah. I'm fine. As soon as they say that, <clears throat> we're, not going to, we're not providing Medicaid. Uh, there's about a three-year uh, look back trying to get people qualified for it. And then the second thing, which is frustrating for us in West Virginia, is to find somebody that will go out and do that work for you in the home. And they only provide five hours of care in, in home. That's not enough. You know, it just, Would a custodial nephew or child or something, somebody, some, a relative who will take care of mom and dad, does that qualify as... It won't qualify unless they're medically qualified and pass, you know, pass through the Department of Health and Human Resources. But again, John, they're only going to pay five hours, you know, for that care. Now, what you can do, and this is what we talked about last time, was we can do what is called a care agreement. What the care agreement says is, because if mom and dad pay child for doing work for them, that's considered a gift in most every state out of love and affection, unless mom and dad do a contract saying. I want to pay my son or child or daughter for working for me and and uh, put it into a contract. Now West Virginia requires that you get a doctor's statement saying mom and dad need this so they can stay home and you got to get a comparative value. So what we do is we go to the Commission on Aging and I use Mineral County's Commission on Aging just because it's comparative values to through the pain needle in this whole area. And that gives me a comparative value. Now mom and dad can pay the child for staying there and taking care of them. Uh, Danny, uh, if someone is, has no assets and they're dependent upon Medicare and Social Security uh, for, to cover their medical care, do they have to be in the state of which they're official resident? No. So, they, so someone could live, be uh, the official resident of Virginia. They could come to West Virginia. That's right. And, Were you referring to Keith's question on Facebook? Yes, I was. Though? Yes. I yeah. Was. Yeah. Yeah. Keith's question was, if an elderly woman from Ohio has been staying with her children in West Virginia for the past few years due to her declining health, she's still technically an Ohio resident, is on Social Security and Medicare. She's going into a skilled care and then probably a nursing home. She has no assets, no home, only Social Security. Does she 
need to become a West Virginia resident to get Medicaid for nursing homes? What's interesting with that question is, and federal law says, once I go into a nursing home in West Virginia, I become a West Virginia resident. If I go to Maryland in a nursing home in Maryland, I become a you know, resident of, of Maryland. And, and I know this sounds strange, but a lot of times in Maryland, you know, with the nursing homes, you go in, they have a voter's registration for you. Yeah. By that time, you would feel that they were disabled, but they still, you know, have the person fill out a voter's registration. Let me go back to long-term care for a second, sure. uh, Danny. Uh, the premiums have have been going up. We've yes. had we've been long-term care uh, uh, insurance policy for at least the last twenty twenty-five years, uh, and for cer- most of that time, the premiums are static. Mm-hmm. Now, the last two or three years, they've started going up. So yes. they're they're fairly expensive now. Is there an alternative, reasonable alternative to long-term care? Bill, I'm going to answer it this way: if you can if you can afford the long-term care, keep it, because it'll pay for somebody to come into your house you know, to, yeah. to care for you at home, you know, and, and most, and I, this is my political statement. It's not yeah. Republican or Democrat, but I get so upset. Congress will pay for you to go to a nursing home. They won't pay for you to stay at home, won't pay for you to go to assisted living where most, most people would want to be, you know, but I guess that shows the lobbying power of the nursing home, I guess. I mean, that's my only mm-hmm. answer to that, yeah. which is very frustrating because if you ask any, nobody wants to go to a nursing home. If you were wanted to go to a nursing home, I'd say you probably need to be in a nursing home to have that kind of mentality. And it's not. I mean, it's a great resource for our country. It really is. You would think it'd be less expensive at home. It would be. Than it would be in the nursing home. And that's where people would rather be. You know, to mm-hmm. be able to sit at your home where you're comfortable and you know you can you can. Uh, do all of the when we think about nursing homes, I think we certainly I think of end of life times, right? Yes. yes. But this can also be you know a nineteen year old in an auto accident that yes. needs to recover for a year from yes. injuries. Do all of the rules apply? Are they same, the same rules. rules? Same rules. Okay. This is not a you know this is Congress started this um, actually Medicare, Medicare initially covered nursing home costs and then they realized no and then the Medicaid kicked in with all these qualifications. So if you have a, a, a minor child, a 19-year-old, who does mom and dad have, in order for Medicaid to kick in, do mom and dad have to have no assets? No, order? we're looking at the individual. Okay. Yeah, we're not looking at, at mom and dad. Even yeah. though he's a dependent in this case? You said 19? Yeah. Okay, let's make him 17. 17. I'm not sure, John. That's a good question. I'm not sure if, if they would be looking at mom and dad's assets, too. I don't think so. I think they're looking at the individual, really. Right. Yeah, that's, and that brings up a good point. It's not too early to get that power of attorney in place. You know, somebody comes to me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say two things I really need. I hate saying I, it's we need mm-hmm. because we all have to work together to get this done. I need that power of attorney and I need that transfer on death deed. And I've, I can protect your assets. You know, just it, it's very important. I want to kick down a little bit because I know my time's running short is, you know, the other thing you can do is, is you can prepay expenses. For example, somebody going into a nursing home, you know, they've got a house that they may have to take care of. Well, who's going to pay those bills for that year? You can go ahead and prepay like your utility bills. You can prepay, you know, insurance. Uh, The interesting thing about utility bills is if you call your utility company and say, oh, I want to prepay this bill, they're going to tell you no. But if you send them a check, they're not returning it to you. It's going to be a credit. You, you see what I'm saying? You can do home improvements. We had a case where uh, we had to put in new floors, you know, new windows, uh, buy a car. I had a case in Petersburg, West Virginia, where Dad was in a nursing home, and he had $30,000. We bought him a car, you know, and put the daughter's name on with him. So when he passed, it rolled outside the estate, just as I'm telling you. And then they could protect that house. Uh, now, I'm going to say my secretary put in here. It's kind of funny because I could tell she put it in your burglar. Uh, what, yeah, install burglar alarms in your house. <laughs> so anything you buy for mom and dad, you know, it, it's okay. You can't buy things for your children. We had one case where mom and dad, well, mom's getting ready to go into a nursing home, and, and the um, children knew that mom liked to do tithing at church. So they gave the church $30,000. Can't do it. That's a gift. If it's for mom and dad, it's okay. But to give that to the church, can't do it, you know, under our rules. 
you know. And all this is, is laid out in, you know, the federal law. This is everything we're doing. And, you know, you worked hard. You paid your bill. You're a good citizen. For goodness sakes, we can do a little bit for, you know, for our loved ones, you know, uh, to take care of them at the end. Danny, about a minute left. Tell people how they can get in touch with you for more. <laughs> it goes fast, doesn't it? It does go fast. Not well. My name is Daniel Staggers. I'm at 133 East John Street, Martinsburg, West Virginia. Phone number is uh, 304-267-3915. Email address, Daniel, well, actually, I'll go to the office. That's staggersmartinsburg at gmail.com. That will get into the office email. Judy Boykin wants to know when you're going to write your book about your travels. <laughs> tell her it's on the way. On the way, Judy. And, and tell her also she'll be seeing some new ones coming. I mean, <laughs> very nicely done, Danny. Thank you.